Governor John Hickenlooper, Colorado's 42nd chief executive, now in his final weeks of office. Today, he looks at what went well and what didn't, and he looks at what's next, now sizing up a run for national office. And hello, everyone. We are live today from the state capitol, the office of governor, the current and outgoing governor, John Hickenlooper, now in the final weeks of his term. Thank you for your time today, of Governor course. Hickenlooper. Uh, one of my first questions uh, is, uh, I, I've always wondered, you've been here eight years, and you essentially just walked across the park to arrive here uh, eight years ago. I always wondered uh, if you knew leaving there and coming here, if you, watch, if, if you knew what you were getting into, and if it turned <laughs> out to be what you expected. You know, in some ways it was completely different, and I sort of knew it would be different, but I don't think I uh, assessed how different it was. Uh, and I knew I was leaving something behind. In other words, uh, Denver is a strong mayor, former government. The mayor makes, uh, appoints everyone to run the city, makes the budget. If city council wants to change one line item in the budget, it takes nine out of 13 votes. So the mayor really does control and shape the budget and the direction with, with, with a strong le level of, of you know, direction. It, here in the state, it's really the, the budgetary authority is, is given to the General Assembly. And they have a thing called the Joint Budget Committee. It's, you know, when the, when the houses are split, it's three Republicans and three Democrats. And they look at, I make the budget. I hire all the people. I make the budget. And they look at it and they smile and they say, well, that's okay, but I don't like this, I don't like this, I don't like this. And so it's a, real, it's a, it's a long negotiation with the Joint Budget Committee that is, uh, it's good. I think it's healthy. I don't think one system's better or worse than the other, but it is much different when you're trying to navigate a system where the final authority is not vested in your office, it's in the, in the legislative branch. Yeah, probably a lot more negotiating for you than when you were governor and you well, were the law. Well, we're doing the budget right now for, for this next year, my last budget, and we, we looked at, in almost every year, with one exception, every year we asked for a certain amount of money, tried to be frugal, and the Joint Budget Committee spent more money than what we asked for every year. And I think that's the balance. If, if I was gonna, if I had a magic wand and I could will something for the next governor, to allow him to have more specific vetoes. You know, the, but the governor has a veto capacity, a line item veto, but the line items are so large that you would end up eliminating things you really cared about. Uh, whereas if you had a, a, the ability to do narrow line item vetoes, I think that the, uh, a fiscally conservative governor could restrict some of the growth in spending. Are you ready to be done with it? Are you melancholy about it? Are you anxious to get on with whatever is next? Where are you on leaving in a few weeks? No, I think there, you know, when I, when I got laid off as a geologist back in, in 1986, so our company got sold, everyone got laid off, they had an industrial psychologist come and talk to each person. You got an, each person got one-on-one -on -one an hour with the psychologist. And my takeaway was that what he was really driving home was that all change involves loss. Even change that you welcome, all change involves loss and all loss has to be mourned. And I think that's, I recognize that this is gonna be a, a, a big change for me and it will entail some loss and there's gonna be some sadness, right? I'm gonna to have to mourn that, that, that just the whole difference that my life will take. Doesn't mean that going forward, I'm not gonna have uh, a better time. I'm not gonna be more creative or, or come up with better ideas or any, in no way is a value judgment of the future versus the past. It's just mourning the past to make sure that when you do the future, you can really embrace it. And I think that's part of the success we've had as governor was that we did you know, we mourned the path, you know, leaving the city, but we really recognized that, I mean, one of the reasons I got elected, right, I'm the first Denver mayor in 140 years to get elected governor. And it was because we did preach that Denver's proper role was to help the rest of the state, was to go out, for, when I ran I, I, for mayor, I said I was gonna help the suburbs. Uh, you know, Denver water should, would be more supportive of the su suburbs, we would be more, uh, conservation mind around our water, that we, we, we realized we could never be a, a great city without great suburbs. And people responded to that back in 2003 and 2004 beyond what I could have ever measured. You know, the smart people said, oh, well, you'll never win with that kind of a premise. Well, we won. I got 65% of the vote. And they said, well, you'll never get reelected if you're giving away water to the suburbs. Right. 
Well, I got reelected with 87% of the vote. I think there's a hunger for pe people want to see elected officials go beyond part partisan politics, go beyond the traditional boundaries, right? The, the city of Denver is always supposed to be at war with the suburbs. Why is that? If city, the city and the suburbs work together, they're both going to do better. And I think that was what, you know, we're going to have broadband to every part of the state of Colorado by the end of, of possibly by the end of 2021, and certainly 2022. We'll be the first big state, large area state, to get to every town with broadband, I think, in the country. And really what that is, is that's some tax revenue coming out of the urban areas, and a little sliver is being used to make sure that the rural areas can have a, a fair shot at a good economy. Every time I say that to people in Denver, I say, taking some of your tax money, going to give it to the rural areas to help them get more jobs. No one's ever argued, not one. Everyone says, well, as long as it's just a little, and as long as they really need it, yeah, we want, we want to make sure that, the, that there's a healthy economy in all parts of Colorado. A great negotiator. You had such an interesting patho. You were, you were an oil man. You were a restaurateur. Uh, I, I remember covering the pig races down there, by the way, at the Lodo Bar and Grill. Uh, bangers and mash. Uh, You're you dating know, yourself. I know. I, 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 I go way back. But uh, I, was, I always wondered what made you decide to make the leap uh, into politics from, from completely disparate right. professions. And I, I had never run for student council. I really didn't like the people that did. I mean, I didn't hang around in those groups. Uh, skinny kid, I had these thick glasses, looked like the bottom of Coke bottles had been hammered out. And there were two things, maybe three things, but two things that really drove it home. We did the, the polling. You know, at that time, the taxpayers were paying for the, the large majority of building a new Mile High Stadium. And everyone was excited about this new, the Broncos had won the Super Bowl, people were behind it. And then they got, you know, about halfway finished, and all of a sudden it, you began to hear noises about, well, maybe we're going to sell the naming rights. And all these people came into my restaurant and were, what's going on? How can they sell the naming rights? And I became kind of a champion of that movement, and we actually went out and I got 500 bucks from a bunch of guys around the bar, and I put in 1,000 bucks, and we got a couple questions added on to another poll. I think we spent $4,000 with Floyd Cerulli, and it showed that 70% of the people in the metropolitan Denver region were happy to pay the extra $4.28 a year to keep the name Mile High Stadium. I'll be. And it turned out there were good reasons why it was being sold. And you know, it, it, we got a compromise, one of the only cities in America where it, was, it became Invesco Field at Mile High. Uh, I think that was, was very powerful and showed me that a, a single person could have an impact on how decisions are being made. And after that, several people, a guy named Chris Gates, uh, Chris Romer, Governor Roy Romer's son, uh, Andrew Hudson, who was the head of, uh, of communications for Mayor Webb, separately, they all came up and said, you know, Mayor Webb's term limited out in 2003. You should think about running. Hmm. And I was like, what? Why would I ever do that? Uh, but then around the bar, a bunch of the, my friends in the bar said, you know, I was the one that said, when they would complain about elected officials, that's a bum, he's a bum, right. she's, she's useless. Yeah. I'd say, but this is America. They are us. If you don't like them, you should, you should run for you should office run, and take right. their place. Somehow they turned that against me. <laughs> so I became the one and that had to are. turn. <laughs> and I must say, you've had some spirited campaigns against some really, uh, some large fields, uh, uh, some experienced politicians in those fields, uh, and you've done really well. Do you like campaigning? Is, cam is campaigning something you look forward to? Uh, do you enjoy it or do you dread it? Where are you on campaigning? Well, the thing about campaigning it's a challenge, and, and, they, and they call them campaigns because they are warlike. I mean, you have a strategy, you have to, I mean, you have a battle plan. And even when you go into a debate, you have specific strengths and weaknesses, you know what you're gonna go after with your opponent. We tried to change that a little bit and, and stay more positive. And actually, I mean, still competitive. I'm still try, trying to create a contrast bef between how people look at me and, and me as a person and a candidate and how they look at the other person. So when other people were doing, trying to attack me, I kind of would welcome it. I mean, you don't welcome it too much, right? <laughs> right. Um, but I think, I, I mean, I do love it. I love campaigns, I love campaigning. I, I love people, you know, on any of those Myers-Briggs, any of those tests, I'm off the scale, I'm, I'm a big extrovert. I get energy by spending time with people. Uh, and I love ideas, I love policy, I love trying to figure out what is the solution to homelessness? How are we gonna 
how are we going to get how are we going to figure this out what are what are we going to do about affordable housing you know and as people move here how can we create enough new housing to not you know leave teachers and firefighters without shelter or not to mention all the the people that are working at lower paid jobs that kind of stuff i think is to to work with the smartest people you can imagine on problems that really matter where the where the solution matters I mean, that's catnip to me, right? <laughs> I, I just get, I get, uh, I mean, I love being pushed to, to, to work as hard as I can uh, to find solutions that will make a difference. You're energized by it. So here you are, you're a big, you're a big idea guy and you like campaigning. So now here comes the, uh, the uh, political action committee, your new pack, the giddy up pack, uh, <laughs> which is uh, familiar in your, in your lingo. It includes a lot of your old and very professional friends and some political operatives. I think Brad Komar is in there and uh, Roxanne White's in there or was initially, I think maybe perhaps still is Stephanie Donner. So a lot of your, your old hands from your earlier campaigns and uh, you, uh, you know, that's, that's a pretty impressive group. So the big question is, you know, what, what's next for you? Is, is that what's next for you? Another big campaign, a national run, right. where are you going? Well, the giddy up is allowing me to make that decision. And the notion was that I could raise a little money, hire some staff. So Roxanne White is helping us put together policy teams. I think she's up to 200 people that are donating their time to look at each one of these policy issues, right? And it goes everywhere from international security, national defense, right through homelessness. How do you, uh, how do, you do a better job with uh, foster kids? And how do you get more of them adopted? I mean, those kinds of, from the very grand and, 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 and international to the really, truly local, we're trying to th rethink through everything and say, all right, what would a campaign look like? And then I go out, and I've been going to places like you know, almost anywhere where I'll go, it's the midterms, right? So you can go and you can get in front of a group of people that are fired up about one thing or another, and you can ask them, well, what do you think about this? And here's what I think about that. And what do you think about someone from Colorado who's maybe not as, uh, as far left as people on the East Coast or the West Coast, but someone who came from business, uh, someone who was laid off and was out of work for a while, understands what that's like, you think there would be an appetite for that kind of a person in a, in a presidential campaign? Because, you know, I don't know about other people. I know that I didn't just wake up one morning and look in the mirror and go, that's what a president looks like. <laughs> you don't think of yourself as a president. You, you really have to explore the idea. And in the, you know, it's funny, when you talk to people, at least when I talk to people, uh, they reflect back to me what they really think. Sometimes it's not with words, but you can tell whether they think it's, crazy or a good idea or a bad idea. Uh, and, and I expected the people in Colorado that knew me would think it was a great idea. I thought right. we'd raise a bunch of money. Sure. All that was true. But I've been surprised that people in other parts of the, you know, I was in North Carolina last summer. I was in uh, uh, New Hampshire, uh, Florida. And I think there is more of an appetite than people think for someone who is willing to try and go outside of the partisanship of political parties and, and get stuff done uh, and really accomplish things. And we'll see. I mean, it's easy to meet people and they pat you on the back and tell you how great you are. Does that translate into large numbers of people, you know, coming together and getting excited and saying, all right, we're going to make this happen? We'll see. Is there a clock on that? I mean, are, are you being pushed to make an announcement, a, a formal decision? I mean, you've, you've had conversations with Bloomberg. I mean, a lot of national press chasing you now. I mean, is, is there a moment when you have to stand up and say, okay, here I am, let's go? Yeah, I think there, I, I'm not sure when that is, but I think in the new year, probably, I, I've been thinking in terms of March, really the, the middle, or end, end of February, the middle of March at the latest, let's say, somewhere in there, I think. Because otherwise you're just, it's a big endeavor. And you've got to put together teams and get everyone in the right place. And, and the, and the giddy-up pack allows me to get, begin to put together teams. But if I pull the trigger and we're going to go full head-on into this, I have to, you've got to ramp things up very quickly. Some, I, I told someone I was having a conversation with you, and they're saying, you know, and they're, they're not from Colorado. They wanted to know, is he a moderate? Is he a conservative Democrat? I mean, where... Where is he on the line? And, and I said, well, I think he's a moderate. And he says, well, then he can't be a Democrat because there's no place in the Democratic <laughs> Party for anybody who's moderate these days. So where, where do you put yourself? Do you, how, how do you characterize yourself? You know, I have, if you look at the basic issues uh, that define many Democrats, so uh, universal health care. You know, 
we can fight over how, what height we provide health care to our citizens. But I, and, and I wrote a letter to the editor of a local newspaper back in 1978 that health care, basic health care, some form of basic health care, should be a right, not a privilege. And that was in 1978. It should be a single payer, should be Medicare for all. I think that is less important than having the vision that everyone should get some sort of health care. Should we have, uh, should the, when people are working 40 hours a week, should they be able to afford an apartment, a place to live, right? 40% of our homeless population are working, right? At least 35 hours a week. Is that, I mean, I think that's outrageous. And, and I think government has to act. If people work, you know, go to work every day, they should be afford, able to afford a place to live. Sure. That is, I think, one of the basic parts of the American dream, right? So is that moderate or is that extreme? I, I think in, in many cases, I come down on the side of, of a pragmatic, uh, or, or let's, let's put it this way, an extreme pragma pragmatist. Is that right? Is that, is that even such a thing? Uh, <laughs> we'll say it is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I, I am pretty, on social issues, I am pretty liberal. And in terms of uh, fiscal matters, I am generally pretty conservative. When Pundit Locally describes you as a banjo playing beer aficionado uh, with a really good knack for politics. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where that puts you on the scale either, but yeah. I wanted to ask you about uh, the compensation for this job because it just, it just seems uh, not at all commensurate with the position. I mean, your commission of agriculture makes more money than you do. The, the mayor of, of Denver makes more money than, than this more. office, much more. Uh, there's a little bump coming next year, but still. And I know, I know that for your part, uh, you, you've largely uh, uh, either given away or, or donated um, uh, most or much or all of the salary. But still, uh, I think Colorado's now 48th in terms of where it pays its governor. And how do, I, I, I heard you once say, you know, I don't know that we necessarily want anyone in here who doesn't know how to balance a checkbook. <laughs> you know, although, although, although $90,000 is a lot of money to a lot of people still, for a chief executive with all the things you do and all the people that you manage, it seems low for the, for the yeah, position. Yeah, I mean, it's a $31 billion budget and you're managing, you know, over 35,000 people. It, it is a low payment, but there's a reason for that, and that's because your rewards are, are come in other varieties. And I think that's something that people forget, that there's a tremendous uh, feeling of, of, of gratitude and fulfillment when you actually solve one of these problems. And you begin to say, you know, we provided long-acting reversible contraception, so IUDs, nor plants, to, to low-income women from age 15 to 25. And over the last eight years, we've reduced uh, teenage pregnancy and teenage abortion by 60%, right? That's a real number for Colorado. We, we've been more successful than any state in history. You know, you wake up in the morning and you say, I changed those lives. There's, you know, each year, several thousand young women that would have had a, an accidental pregnancy, right? And in most cases would have gone ahead and, and had a family that would have made their lives more difficult, more challenging in, in, in so many ways. We were able to, to come around that. So, I do think I do support paying the next governor more, um, and I don't think it, you know, it shouldn't be limited to just people that don't need the money, right? Uh, I was, over the last eight years, I think I can safely say that I have donated away every dollar that, that, that I was compensated, because I wanted to make sure that, that people didn't think I was doing this for any self-purpose, right? That, that I was determined at every step to do things exactly right. Uh, and I think that's, you know, hopefully the next governor, which whoever the next governor is, will follow in those same steps and say, we're about, we're all about doing this for the good of Colorado, not for any self-benefit to ourselves. Uh, you've been a part of a lot of uh, uh, great causes and legislation, a lot of gun issues, uh, background checks, for example, ammunition, magazine bills, uh, Medicaid expansion, education packages. You just, uh, I know you've been talking uh, this week with PBS and everybody else about marijuana, and it seems to be a recurring thing. Are, are we going to forever be defined by marijuana in Colorado? Do you think the stigma being first eventually goes away, or do we wear that label for now and all eternity? I think we are going to see that label for a long time, not for all eternity, but we will. We did it first, and whether we like it or not, Washington passed it the same day we did, but they put off implementation for a full year. So we had to kind of go it alone. And you know, we made some mistakes, but I think overall, on measure, 
we demonstrated, uh, first I can honestly say we worked as hard as we could to make it a success. And there were folks out there that said, throw a wrench in it, make sure it fails. We don't want this. But the voters, you know, when you become governor, you take an oath to uphold and protect the Constitution of Colorado. This is in our, this is in our, our Constitution. So, you know, in the end, so many of the things we most feared didn't happen. We didn't see a spike in consumption. We didn't see a dramatic rise in teenage consumption. Uh, we, didn't, we don't have a good baseline on people driving while impaired, but we certainly haven't seen any dramatic increase in consumption, which would lead one to assume that people aren't driving while high anymore. And certainly nowadays, we've got the resources through the tax money to do ads and say, do not drive while you're high. It is, you know, every bit as bad as driving while drunk. And you put the two things together and it's 10 times worse. So we have those resources to put out ads and, and, and push it. But it was, you know, you don't want to be in conflict with the federal government, right? I, I opposed it. I mean, pretty much every elected official I know in Colorado opposed, opposed it. Opposed it, correct. Right. But it, at this point, you have to look back and say, huh, it wasn't as bad as what we thought. Right. I know that uh, early on there, you would preface uh, every uh, news conference question about it. Well, you know, I opposed it. However, <laughs> that was kind of the starting point for it. Best moment as governor? Best uh, moment. Is, it, is there a best moment? Oh, my God. There's, there, there are so many. You know, the... Besides this interview, best moment as governor. <laughs> I'd say one of the great... Many of the great moments are when you are in places completely out of context. So two years ago, and, and this last J July too, but two years ago I went to the Brush Fourth of July Parade. And it's one of the smallest towns, but one of the largest parades. Yeah. And everybody, every man, woman, and child for miles and miles around comes out there. And you see this incredible cross-section of people. And you know we've got there an hour early, spent, stayed a couple hours later, so you get to talk to a lot of the, of the folks. And, to me, that's the thing that makes this worth more than, 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 you could, than I could ever describe. You, you get to meet people that I could have never met if I just stayed in the restaurant business. You have, I have a friend now who lives up in, 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 uh, in Morgan County, uh, right outside Fort Morgan, named Keith Bath. And he has kind of, he, he's got a, some machines that stamp feed corn. They, they put it in water for a while, they stamp it, and it allows dairy cattle to get 40% more nutrients. And I don't know. I mean, Keith Bath, he certainly never went to college. I bet he didn't finish high school. But he's wiser and smarter than almost anyone else I know, you know, with, you know, graduate degrees. And to, for me to have over the last eight years, I met him right when I was first campaigning in 2010, to get to know him, and he comes to the State of the State speech every year, oh, comes to the holiday parties. If I'm up in that part of the world, I always chase him down and we try to get together and have lunch or something. What a gift it is to me to meet someone like Keith Bath who shares his wisdom with me. There's a, a rule in, in my business in television that says, not everybody will like you all of the time, and a lot of people will just hate you for eternity. Uh, you seem to, as a politician, you see, seem to have been able to jump that shark. You just, uh, you're just a real popular guy, an easy to get along with guy. Uh, you're, you're, you're a guy with a, a lot of panache as a governor, but you still kind of are a roll your sleeves up blue collar kind of guy. Is, is, that, is that something that you, attribute most of your success, success to us, or is that just how you are? Well, I think I've always been that way, but, but because of that, that's how I ended up in the restaurant business when we opened the wine coop. And, you know, that's a blue collar business, right? You, you work 60 and 70 hours a week. Sure. The first five years, I paid myself 25,000. First, first two years, $24,000 a year, then 25 and then 26,000. But, I mean, that's just kind of a blue collar existence. You work, most of your friends are where you work. Uh, you, you have this kind of, you know, this life that is very rich and very deep, but, but again, the people were amazing. And I think, you know, A, I, I don't think I'm that popular as a governor. You know, I have a, I think, I, I can't remember the last thing I saw, 62, 64% approval rating, that's good. Well, that means that 35 or 37% <laughs> of the people don't approve right, of me. Exactly, right. So yeah. there's always a, uh, certainly when we did the universal background checks and Every Republican I talked to thought that they were a good idea, but none turned out once we proposed them that none of the elected Republican officials, right. you know, they said crooks aren't stupid. Well, it turned out that when we went back and looked at the, the background checks we'd gotten, 
uh, was 19, uh, 2012 was the year we'd gotten to half the gun purchases. There were 38 people convicted of homicide who tried to buy a gun and we stopped them. There were, in the end, 240 people that when they came to pick up their new gun, we arrested them for an outstanding warrant for a violent crime. Turns out crooks were that stupid. Did that make people like me or, I mean, we stuck firm on that. And in, in a funny way, it, it did divide us in a way that perhaps there's a better way we could have done it. I'm not sure about that. But popularity is, a, you know, in the end, you sort of got to do what you think is right. Right. Well, I know that's, that's, what's, that's what you're hoping for and whatever comes next. And we, we will follow you and we look forward with great interest to whatever comes next for you. Governor John Hickenlooper, thank you so much yeah, for your time thank today. Thank you. What a pleasure. Good luck to you.